So thank you very much to ECHA for giving us the opportunity to explain a little bit about our voluntary recommendation. I'll talk a little bit about the background to the recommendation, a little bit to, about the approach to the recommendation. I'll talk about how we followed up the recommendation. I'll talk about the outcomes. I'll give you an update on the outcomes in this presentation. And in the end, I'll talk a little bit and quite frankly about some of the challenges that we've faced in implementing the recommendation. Okay, so here's some general information about our organization. Cosmetics Europe is the trade association representing the cosmetics and personal care uh, industry in Europe. Uh, together we represent more than 90% of the European industry. A couple of points to note on this slide. Firstly, the European cosmetics and personal care market is by far the biggest in the world. We make a very significant economic contribution, directly and indirectly, 2 million jobs. We're also a colossal exporter, 20 billion uh, euros worth of export from our industry. Another point is that though many people are aware of uh, the, the household names uh, associated with our industry, some of whom are in the room today, it's not quite so well known that we're very much an SME driven industry, particularly in certain markets in Europe. And uh, if you add in the SMEs, or as I say, the contribution is a little bit less well known, then we're representing in excess of 4,500 European companies. And I stress this point because the SME dimension to this question is important when we come to think about the effects of the recommendation and perhaps going forward. Uh, the effects of a restriction. I'll also say one other thing, uh, perhaps uniquely among the sectors presenting today, I can virtually guarantee that all of you are either using one of our products or have used one of our products during the course of the day, given that on average European citizens use six a day uh, cosmetics and personal care products. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our recommendation. Uh, I'll go straight to the bottom point just to highlight this point that I think it's common ground among all the stakeholders in this debate that uh, the contribution to uh, aquat aquatic plastic litter from our sector is a very minor contribution. We look at that particular study, which is cited at the bottom uh, of 0.1 percent or 2 percent. However, let's not dwell on that. Notwithstanding that, we recognize that we, are, uh, we have a contribution to make in trying to address the problem. We're an environmentally conscious industry and we realize that the onus is on us where appropriate and possible to take the positive action that we can. So that is why uh, some years ago now, October 2015, we adopted the recommendation that we did. I should stress at this point that prior to the recommendation, some companies had already begun the phase out of plastic microbeads from their products. So our recommendation built on the action of some of our companies. I stress some points in the wording of the recommendation. It's exactly the wording that I've put on the slide there, which I think are important. Firstly, alternative materials. And we'll, uh, I know that part of the theme of our workshop over the, these two days is to look at alternatives. Uh, and this is of particular importance to us because in the case of the plastic microbeads for exfoliating and cleansing that we're talking about, there were available alternatives uh, such as cellulose, such as walnut. Some of those alternatives have been discussed today and are set out in the AMEC report, for example, which you'll be familiar with. The second point is the date, 2020. Now, I'll be honest, when we announced the recommendation, people were quite happy with the recommendation, but some people said, well, why so long? Well, again, this brings a little bit the SME dimension into this question because it's not about just about the bigger companies who perhaps have more machinery at their disposal, if I can put it that, like that, to reformulate. It's also the long tail of SME, SME uh, companies who are, as I say, indirectly members of Cosmetics Europe through national associations who also need to consider that. And also we took into uh, account the time typically that it takes to reformulate products, which can be four, to five, four, four, four and a half to five years when there are alternatives, when there are not alternatives, which is a theme we'll address in the workshop session on cosmetics tomorrow, then that period is uh, a little bit longer, well, considerably longer, I should say. Finally, of course, it was very important to specify what we were talking about, and that's why we were very clear that we were talking about synthetic solid plastic particles that asked some questions about definitions, definitions are fundamental to this whole question, not just for our sector, but for all affected sectors 
of course, as well. Secondly, um, it is not enough for us to make a recommendation and get a little, a little bit of good PR and to stick the recommendation in a drawer and hope everybody forgets about it. I don't think that's the right way to go. It's not good practice for voluntary recommendations in the environmental field or any field whatsoever. So when we made the recommendation, we committed to follow up and very openly ensure or check, we can't ensure so much, but check at least if our recommendation was being followed and if the ultimate objective, the environmental objective of phasing out plastic microbeads for exfoliating and cleansing was being achieved. Okay, very briefly on definitions. These are the definitions that we used. I think the broad point here is that, as many people in the room will be aware, I think cosmetics is the only sector which has had actually implemented legally effective regulation, both here in Europe and elsewhere, for example, notably the United States, Canada as well. Our definition that we adopted uh, is pretty much in line with the definitions which have been adopted in the uh, implemented regulatory measures for our sector hitherto. I don't need to stress to you all, we're all aware, whatever part of the spectrum we come on this debate, that is absolutely important to get the definition right. I'm sure it's been made, made, the point has been made many times during the course of the, uh, of the World Cafe that all plastic are polymers, but not all polymers are plastics. If you consider polymers are plastic, you get to some rather bizarre results about what, in fact, constitutes plastic. When we are talking about the products involved, we list their rinse-off products. Again, for those of you who noted, we use the term wash-off in our, in our um, recommendation because we wanted to be clear that we're talking about uh, products, uh, microbeads for exfoliating and cleansing, which are uh, designed to be washed off and go down the drain. Um, sometimes the use rinse-off is used in this context. I won't go into the technical differences. For all intents and purposes, for the purposes of our recommendation, are the same. And those are the products that we're talking about listed at the bottom of the side. Champagne, shampoos, champagne, good grief, shampoos. Not yet. Not yet. Hair conditioners, <laughs> Freudian slip. Shower gels, soap bars, toothpaste, shaving, shaving foams, and scrubs and, and for exfoliating products. So... I said to you that we didn't want to put the recommendation in a drawer. We agreed to survey. We've done two surveys. We did a survey quite soon after the recommendation was adopted. You can see the details in the top half of the slide yet there. Um, we covered in our survey 70 to 80 percent of the European market, so it's pretty broad. Uh, the geography was EU plus Norway and Switzerland, and I'll tell you what we got from that result in the next slide. Then, as part of our work on the social and economic assessment and the call for evidence being prepared by ECHA, we've done a broader survey, um, some of which we'll talk about in our session tomorrow, but we took the opportunity to again look at the question of whether our recommendation had made progress since the uh, survey uh, earlier. Uh, you'll see there that uh, in our survey for the social and economic part in the call for evidence, we've looked at 19 substances, and we'll go into the uh, details tomorrow of why we chose those 19 substances. Three substances are, are relevant for plastic microbeads. We asked for tonnages from 2015 and 2016 if 2017 were unavailable. We got data from 56 companies covering 50% of the market. That is a huge sample. Uh, by any standard, uh, that must be considered representative of the entire market, so we extrapolated it to 100% of the market on a sound statistical basis that we had 50% of the relevant population. So what are the results? January 2017, we were relieved, I think, to be very, very frank with you, that we found that the reduction had been uh, rapid and substantial 82%. Now, the figure is 2012 there, because bear in mind, as I said earlier in my presentation, that some of the action in this sphere, in this area, was taken by companies prior to the recommendation, and uh, there was an earlier survey back in 2012. So we're talking about the 2012 to 2015 period, 82% reduction, and you can uh, get some more uh, uh, information about that on our website, and the link is there. Now, moving on, I'm pleased to say that now, in our updated survey, 
we've reached the position happily where we're almost at the threshold of total elimination of plastic microbeads in rinse off, wash off products for exfoliating and cleansing. So that's the more up to date data. If you look at the bar chart at the bottom of the slide, you'll see where we were coming in terms of tonnages since 2012. So, albeit a relatively minor contribution in the greater scheme of things, you might like to say, there were 4,360 tons in 2012. Now, according to our survey, which as I say, is every reason to think is absolutely robust, we're down to 107. So I think that's pretty good news. Now, I was asked by Eckerd to talk a little bit about the challenges uh, in putting together a voluntary recommendation. And again, I'll be very, very honest with you, it wasn't that easy. Some people said, why didn't you come out with a voluntary recommendation earlier? Well, these things take time, particularly those of you who work in the association world uh, will know that it takes a little bit of time to build consensus within an association, particularly, I would say, in cosmetics, not uniquely, but particularly in cosmetics where we have a huge di and diverse range of products within the cosmetics category. You always have to keep an eye on competition law. We needed to have very clear ideas about our definition, as I say, that debate and those issues carry on. There was some debate about the timeline, as I've also mentioned, because particularly our National Association of Members uh, saying that this isn't all about the big players. There are relatively small outfits dotted around Europe who do need slightly longer because they don't have quite the, uh, the advantages of rapid, more, more rapid reformulation than some companies do. Um, and of course, we needed uh, everybody to buy in to the idea that we were going to follow up and assess. On the member company level, well, um, alternatives, alternatives, alternatives. Let me put it that way. It was relatively, and I stress the word relatively, um, doable for companies to replace exfoliating and cleansing microbeads because there are suitable alternatives. Nonetheless, I will stress this point, that reformulation for our industry, and any industry I suspect, is a complex and costly process for many reasons. Alternatives are more expensive. Uh, you have to do various safety tests. You have to do regulatory assessments. You have to look at the availability of raw supplies, and so on and so on and so on. Some of these points are listed out and analyzed in our submission to the call for evidence. If there are no suitable alternatives, there were in the case of plastic microbeads, then more fundamental research is needed, and you're looking at a much longer uh, time horizon. And I've set out a little bit at the bottom there the process that we've, uh, we've, uh, we've, we've uncovered, uh, discussing with our companies about exactly how you go about formula, reformulation. It's not easy, and of course, inevitably, naturally, the more formulations you have, the more complex and costly it is. So let me conclude and say, look, we've got to the point where we've got 97.6% of those plastic microbeads for exfoliating and cleansing gone. We'll get to 100% uh, well before the timeline um, that we initially set ourselves. It does show that voluntary action has a place. It does show that voluntary action appropriately followed up, I would say, is effective and it does work. It does show that our industry kept to its word and recognized that uh, it needed to be environmentally conscious. It needed to play its environmentally conscious role, um, if I can put it that way. We did so, and this is where we've got to. It's positive. As a final thought, and again, I think this is an echo of some of the points that have been made during the discussions today, we're completely committed, as I suspect everybody is in the room, to finding a way forward through the restriction process. We stress, of course, that uh, a uh, restriction needs to be effective in terms of the environmental objective. And we stress, of course, that proportionality is fundamentally important for our industry when the potential costs of significant reformulation, particularly when there aren't alternatives, are, and I use this word advisedly, staggeringly high. We'll discuss some of those issues in our workshop tomorrow. But until then, I thank you for your attention.
Thank you.